¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos al tercer día de esta Semana Mundial de Alergia 2021. Es un gusto que sean todos. Eh, tres, eh, dos días, hoy será el tercero, de grandes sesiones y grandes ponentes. Y en esta ocasión, eh, quien nos va a acompañar como coordinador es el doctor Federico José Saracho Weaver. Él es nuestro primer eh, secretario en Compedia. Él es eh, alergólogo inmunólogo, egresado del Instituto Nacional de Pediatría. Eh, actualmente reside en Chihuahua, trabaja en el Hospital Infantil de Especialidades de Chihuahua. Fue secretario de Salud en, en el estado de Chihuahua. Y es un placer, Federico, que nos acompañes en esta ocasión como coordinador y gracias por haber aceptado. Y nada más quiero dar las gracias al, al patrocinador Glaxo por, por haber sido hecho posible eh, esta semana sin, sin tener intervención en el contenido de las pláticas. I want to thank Glaxo for their sponsorship without having anything to do in the uh, contents of the presentations. We're going to have the sessions in the Q&A. And in the last presentation that we have a foreign speaker, we're going to have interpretation into Spanish. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. It's a pleasure to be with you, and it's an honor for me to see the quality of our presentations, and I'm sure that that's going to increase the quality of the presentations we've had. In order to continue with our program that has been set forth, we have the presentation of a topic that is extremely important because of all the controversies that have uh, uh, come up. We have a wonderful speaker, Dr. Blanca Estela del Rio Navarro. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine at Mexican Academy of Pediatrics, head professor of the specialty of immunology and allergy at UNAM. She's at the Children's Hospital. She was graduated from that hospital. She's a national investigator of the National System of Investigators, ex-president of the National Council of Immunology and Allergy, ex-president of Compedia. Blanca, it's a pleasure to have you here today and we are here for you. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be with you today and to see some of the practical characteristics of anaphylaxis in the case of vaccines. What is this? The protection of infectious diseases. This is uh, uh, because uh, uh, it has uh, been decreased uh, because of the use of vaccines. So anaphylaxis is a hypersensitivity reaction that is serious. It suddenly starts and potentially fatal. And that's going to compromise our airway, breathing, circulation. But we have to remember that not necessarily there's a mucocutaneous uh, that is affected or a state of shock. So what is the world incidence of anaphylaxis? This is globally, this is entire world. It includes medication, foods, but what about vaccines? Why this severe reaction, life-threatening and sudden? Well, the events that can be attributed to vaccination and immunization, they are called ESAVIS. And there's an entire manual uh, of, uh, the, that is standardized for the immunological surveillance of this. And as you can see, as we go from 2014 to 2019, then we started to see more records And that was uh, very good for us. And in the group from uh, the age group, 
the older group that we for COVID, the ones that we used to vaccinate the most were children. These were the ages, the most frequent ages that had a savvy's adverse events attributed to vaccination. And which vaccines in pediatrics are the ones that are more reported and severe effects? Well, diphtheria, tetanus, or whooping cough, you can see here the percentages that we had were, uh, nationwide. This is an adverse event that can happen at any age or gender when we have clinical manifestations that is within the first 30 days and can be attributed at a vaccination. It disappears without treatment. It is not life threatening or risk of hospitalization. That's what is savvy. And these are the features or characteristics of this uh, savvy in Spanish. What is a severe es savvy is an event that can cause death in a patient that is life threatening when this happens. Oh, it can have, uh, you know, persistent uh, disability. There are the exceptions of uh, 42 days with rotavirus vaccine, Sabin 42, and BCG two months. Who reports them? Doctors. If it's severe, it has to be reported in less than 24 hours. Well, if it's severe, well, less than 48. Who gets notice of this? Well, at the local, state, and national level. Well, and who de determines the effect? Well, there's a group, a group of experts that is going to make the final classification of the e savvy supposedly attributable to vaccination or immunization. And so we have a causal association. This is consistent with vaccination is related to the vaccine. So what other one is that is not determined that we don't have any results is contradictory. And the other one is a causal association that is not consistent with the vaccination. Well, it's an underlying condition, emerging condition that is caused by the expression of something that is different from the vaccine. And D, and as a causal association with the conditions that are inherent to the vaccinated party. Well, somebody that has already problems, uh, asthma out of control, somebody that goes and gets a vaccine and then uh, has a crisis, but it has some uh, data like anaphylaxis. And it's seen whether that that crisis was uh, uh, caused by the vaccine or a patient with high blood pressure, and it has more high blood pressure after that. So what are the uh, reports of anaphylaxis by vaccinated uh, uh, people, the pediatric, adults, teenagers? There's a revision from 2016 from the W. Uh, AO that reports an estimated rate of anaphylaxis to vaccine that goes from one in 100,000 to one in 1 million. What happened between 2014 and 27 in 2019, there were 13, 365 cases reported out of which they were 1,337 were severe, 10.2 percent. What were the uh, vaccines that were involved the most? Flu, BCG, exavalent, and DPT. This, I say this because often as pediatricians, we vaccinate and we don't have a, um, a constant letter where we should say what are the effects that should be caused, particularly if they are at risk of uh, anything. We have a study in from the or trial from the United States that was a follow-up of three years, where basically they applied 
and administered 25,173,965 doses, out of which the incidence of an ad severe adverse event of anaphylaxis was 1.31, and you can see the interval. And they saw this in these three years, and the vaccines that are involved the most, as you can see, the measles, the flu, uh, uh, MMR, it's a very interesting, 12%, 12 in 100,000, I'm sorry. So this was important. What else do we have? The trivalent anti-flu vaccine was the one that contributed the most in the number of vaccines that cause anaphylaxis per 1 million doses that were administered. The case of uh, anaphylaxis uh, uh, against the uh, flu, diphtheria, tetanus, pneumococci, 23-valent, hepatitis, also had an important report in the incidence of anaphylaxis. According to the population worldwide, you know, 500,000 to one in a million, in 2016, the WAO said one in 100,000 and one in a million, well, one in 500,000 or one in a million. This is important in a pediatric age, it can happen because it's where we, uh, vaccinate most and what is the vaccination high uh, hypersensitivity to all the mechanisms we have seen this in detail with dr ortega otherwise i recommend that you watch it when the presentations are on demand and you can see that all the hypersensitivity mechanisms are implied type one is uh, uh, IgE mediated, that is very frequent, but let's not forget that it can also be involved as type four and type three. And let's remember, not only by IgE, but it could be by complement, it could be by act, direct activation of this protein, and this releases the mediators and gives us clinical manifestation of anaphylaxis. That's how we have that after all this vaccine, 1.31 of the vaccines that we are given in pediatric patients, the ones that I have mentioned basically. And within this number of doses that were given out, as you remember. What do we have in vaccines? What is the allergy? What are they having a secondary reaction? Is If it's not by IgE, it could be may, maybe because of the complement or maybe because there's the activation of TLR or maybe a different protein. But what is there? Antigen? Well, could it be the antigen? You can see the excipients of the vaccine are multiple. You can see them, for example, fructose, dextrose, ademinose, adenovirus, BCG, aspergine, citric acid. You can see he, DP, DTP, formaldehyde, aluminum hydroxide, polysorbate. What is this? You know, this is so, this is being studied, the reaction of the vaccines that I'm going to be discussing later for COVID. But here, see, this is hepatitis B, sodium chloride and formaldehyde, sucrose, excipients. And we can say so many things. What are excipients in the uh, vaccine? Well, some of them are going to make the vaccine stable, like gelatin. It's a product there that is a byproduct of, of collagen, partially hydrolyzed from mammals. And well, which one uh, is RP, uh, you know, flu, um, measles, yellow fever, and rabies. What do we have to see? We need to read the insert of the vaccine. The manufacturer must tell us what it has. Maybe it's not going to tell us the quantity or amount, but it has to give us a list of the contents of the ingredients. It's important because it those patients that suffer from an allergy it, to one of the products might be at risk. 
alpha gal is galactose alpha that is in multiple the tissues of different animals we're currently we have many vaccines that are culture in the cell lines we have to be careful because maybe we can have a residues from the meat of mammals and we can have a reaction. And this is, for example, this is a patient that had a reaction where they got the virus of the zoster and it had uh, uh, some history of allergy to certain meat. Dextran is not being used anymore, but it was in the vaccine against rotavirus. And it, and maybe it was uh, part of the manifestations that was mediated by the complement that is carpa syndrome, anaphylaxis by complement, and they could have caused anaphylaxis. Very rare, but it has to be taken into account. Well, not only the preservatives, we have adjuvants as well. Aluminum hydroxide that we have not found much, but it has been estimated that it could be an adjuvant that can cause anaphylaxis. We have esqualine. Esqualine is its substance is fat that can cause immediate hypersensitivity. It had been used as adjuvant in this vaccines, like in the flu vaccine for 2017 and 2016, it's an oiled, the esqualine adjuvant. Well, we have antiseptic, phenol, timerosal, that is a preservative. Many vaccines have uh, removed timerosal because of the uh, danger of being uh, contaminated with mercury, where we have more problems when you use the multi-dose vials. I'm talking about the flu vaccine. You have seen that because when it's a single dose, we have uh, less uh, side effects than when it's a multi-dose vaccine. And we have what I mentioned of multi-dose, basically. Another one, phenoxyethanol, that you know that is being used in cosmetics of, uh, you know, of thalmic solutions, antiseptic. This was one of the causes of report of anaphylaxis in soap, milk. Yes, yes the milk is in nanograms, but yes, it can cause it. Why? Well, because the growth of uh, tetanic clostridium in certain media that have uh, traces of uh, milk can give us uh, problems. We have to pay attention because it's in nanograms. We still have to take into account in this vaccines. So we recommend to be careful in patients that are sensitive, uh, so it's not counterindicated, and it has to be watched closely. These patients have to be watched closely. These are the vaccine that, as I mentioned, in the growth of the tannic clostridium, and uh, this has been the, um, in latham uh, medium with the bovine casein, and we have to pay attention when we use this. Ovo albumin, that's when the reaction is uh, mediated by IgE, and that affects from 0.52% of the pediatric patients. That, uh, you know, uh, measles or, uh, well, the MMR uh, can cause uh, uh, cultures of fibroblasts in, embryo in chicken embryos. Well, this has changed, and they have. They have been lucky that the, the, the level albumin is in nanograms, therefore is not counterindicated in patients with allergies. So the uh, flu vaccines come from a virus uh, from that grew in chicken, but some have been allergic to chicken. And we have to pay attention to that. There are recombinant vaccines and that has really opened uh, the road and hope for those patients that were allergic to certain products that were in the excipients or vaccines. And they're helping us to 
be, uh, you know, just at, yeah, at ease that our patients are not going to have other type of results. Well, will each vaccine have we used and we have seen that it needs an allergy specialist, yellow fever in which patients in those patients that are allergic to egg, if they're going to travel to certain places where they need it, antimicrobial, well, also throughout the processing, we must make sure that they're not contaminated with bacteria, with other agents. In that way, many are produced and they have been prepared with certain antibiotics, antimicrobial, as you can see in this picture. So this is used to prevent the growth of bacteria. In the case of uh, measles, uh, polio, flu, they can have uh, uh, some particles. So that's why I was saying that it's important to read for our patients and also to have a detailed history. If the patient has had uh, um, any reactions, phenol has been found in mucosic uh, vaccines, polysaccharide in the vaccinia. However, it has not been associated with anaphylaxis, extrinsic uh, substances like latex, soluble, or the, the, the cap that has been removed already. Something important that is here is of proteins that are called transporting proteins, which can cause anaphylaxis. It's very rare, but we always need to have it in the case of uh, an infant uh, that is healthy and is 12 months old that had anaphylaxis after the fourth dose of a certain uh, vaccine. So this uh, CRM transporting protein that it was a mutant was the one that was causing the problem and was uh, considering this conjugated and combined vaccines. Residual media is impossible in many times to remove all the residual media and sometimes it's left. This is yeast that we have seen in hepatitis B25 uh, uh, milligram vaccine or HPV, the tetra seven micrograms. So we have to take into account and we have seen it in meningococci, 13 val valent conjugated that has this yeast. So it's important even if it's rare to determine if the patients have had uh, reactions in the past and also to get consent and always have the emergency uh, team. You know, children have less communication. They have, uh, uh, they are at less risk where we have more frequently anaphylactic reactions on women, multiple medications. They can also have an influence as coadjuvants. So these are the things that are predisposing, you know, they uh, are there. Co-factors such as exercise, stress, We're interested in this, but children do not tell us a child, you know, gets all the upset and maybe they touch their eyes. We have to be careful. And age is important. Gender is important. Uh, the uh, histories in allergy, um, predisposition and all of that, but their comorbidities of more risk like uncontrolled asthma. And this is rhinitis, and these are not comorbidities that uh, give us more risk, but cardiovascular diseases that have been found. So we must take into account cofactors such as alcohol, exercise, injections, and a few minutes of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. And basically, and you know, the platforms we have, of the vaccines for COVID, 
the messenger RNA, that viral vectors, where it's important to know what it's in those vaccines. You can see Pfizer, it has polyethylene glycol, over 2,000 Moderna, polyethylene glycol, 2,000, but the other ones have polysorbates and um, they can have cross reactions. Yes, we can have them. And this is uh, important, Johnson & Johnson, CanSino, Sinovac, aluminum hydroxide and others. So we have to take into account that the ingredients, the excipients must have an allergenic role in our patients. And we have seen this in the first presentation of Dr. Ortega, wonderful presentation, the mechanisms that can be IgE mediated by complement or the activation of receptors that can cause it. And what are the reports that we started seeing? Well, when the vaccine started for COVID, you can see January, 2021, you can see 10 million doses, seven and, uh, and a half million doses of Moderna. And you can see the important thing, females were predominating and the reactions were in the first 15 minutes. And if you take this into account in uh, 30 minutes, 90% had it. So what else can we have? Well, they had reactions, these are the reports, 80 and 30%. And what was the first one, the second dose? What happens more in the first or in the second dose? Everybody says if it's allergy, well, I would expect the second one. Well, no, it was more on the first one. That's why the investigation. And according to the definitions, the one that was giving us the uh, safest cases was uh, Glyton classification where level one was the certainty, uh, the most important certainty. And uh, uh, very important in that uh, time of January 2021 to 4.7 uh, per 1 million doses uh, uh, applied and 2.5 by 1 million doses applied was for Moderna. Well, with time uh, and the number of new vaccines, uh, we have cases. We have in Mexico, Esabi, 17,122 cases. Pfizer, Astra, according to the number of vaccines that were given, remember, the number of adverse, uh, adverse uh, severe events was here. This is anaphylaxis were basically according to the number of doses given in May, at the end of May, we have this 2.5, Pfizer 2.2, Moderna. This is worldwide. 3.39, CanSino. This is Sputnik and AstraZeneca. Very low anaphylaxic reactions but we have to take into account because they are potentially deadly and they can be managed. How do we diagnose? When should we suspect it? Well, you have seen this, you have seen this over and over. Where this is a scenario, there's a, the, the skin can be compromised and this can give us compromise of the skin or you can go to airways, uh, uh, skin compromise or something else. So this is circulatory compromise skin and also respiratory. You can see this has been seen and you can see how the uh, uh, pressure drops, uh, adults under 90, over 30%, and this is choice two, and this is sudden, or I get hypotension, bronchospasms, alterations, and this is important. And this, they have in Conomet, uh, Conomet uh, uh, journal, where we have uh, all the important items for early diagnosis and management. And we're gonna be talking about the management that is so important, where epinephrine, adrenaline, 
play a very important role to save lives. And we have that the classification of the Wrighton criteria, you have seen them, where they certainly level one and two, the biggest the criteria one on the dermatological cardiovascular certainty um, criteria, cardiovascular that is more, and one that is even more, two at the same time. And you can see that the main one is one, but in real life, we can have this or the one that is less specific, but is anaphylaxis is number three, when you have two or more criteria. And what are the major criteria? Well, major criteria, generalized urticaria, angioedema, uh, generalized rash at the vascular level, hypotension or shock. At the respiratory level, we seeing or edema, shortness of breath, where we have two or more of the following use of accessory muscles. You can see major criteria that gives us certainty. and the lesser when they are combined. So you can see that this is going to give us very high certainty and moderated in three and very high in two. Do this and put together your chart when you go to a cardiovascular, this is certainty number one, respiratory derma one. And we add, and we can say, what is our certainty? What are the lab tests? Well. They help us, but the, you can see the clinical the condition is there, but this is a biomarker that helps us. And 24 hours later, you can see the amount they must have to take into account that in patients with mastocytosis is a different criteria. So criteria one, we start skin problems and at least one of the following. The air airway is compromised. We seeing circulatory skin and, uh, uh, you know, problems with pressure, skin and GI problems. It's criteria one. Criteria two, acute uh, starting of some of this bronchospasm, hypotension or respiratory problems with the involvement of the larynx. This is very important. This is anaphylaxis. Surveillance is important in these problems that I have mentioned, where the bigger ones uh, uh, play an important role, and that's the certainty. And we have to take into consideration that in real life with a set of symptoms and whether they're subjective or objective to give it causality in this patients, as you can see. And it's very important to have it in mind for diagnosis. And it's a progressive and potentially life-threatening. And these are the different scenarios that we can have in our patients, basically, that take us to diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Differentiated diagnosis, asthma crisis, syncope, anxiety, and the assessment, you have seen it in all the presentations, the ABC circulation, respiratory circulation, neurological state, and what we can see in children, what's the problem? Children, you can see how different it is, vomit, the changes in behavior, these are babies, so we need to take this into account. And after that, uh, somebody can have anaphylaxis. And it's important to consider in our patients, adrenaline is the first line of basic treatment. And we have really made emphasis in having this and at the doctor's office, what is the dose? You have seen this over and over in our patients. Adrenaline, you can see that should not be diluted. It should be intramuscular. It's very important. This is a child. What do we have to do? Well, immediately we have to describe 
the protocol in our children. If we have seen what we need to have, we need to have the position and immediately adrenaline is what is going to save us. And secondary, well, the solution, patent airway, oxygen, oxygen to monitor. We have to assess a patient. This is the A, B, C. Airway, breathing, circulation, mental state and our patients in order to install immediately a position between this and almost at the same time to measure adrenaline. And because of the fluids, uh, and uh, we uh, have to consider that anaphylaxis is not shock, it's not first skin and then everything else, no. It could be respiratory, and then cardiovascular could be respiratory and symptoms or signs that are major, like I explained in Brighton. And if there are implications of two organs and uh, more systems, we have an action plan to make sure that this progresses. What do we do as allergy specialists in vitro testing? Activation of acephils, yes, what we have seen, that there's a low risk, mid risk, and high risk. So what does this mean? That patients with allergy to foods and to medication should not be getting the vaccine from the platforms and uh, Pfizer and Moderna or CanSino or Sinovac that uh, also shows anaphylaxis? No, we have low risk. As you can see, intermediate risk, where the vaccine is not counterindicated, but surveillance is strict. And where it is contraindicated is when we have an allergic reaction to a medication that has speculated with a molecular weight that is high. It's important to consider this, to take this into account or a component of the vaccine in order to refer to the allergy specialist. And he would determine an assessment and a questionnaire. And with some testing, they would determine whether they're a candidate or what is the risk that this patient can have for this. You can see this from the Committee of Anaphylaxis and ESAVI. You have it, it's free, you can download. And you can see what is the algorithm that you have to do. What is the surveillance and so on. What do you have to take into account in the uh, assessment? Well, when there's food allergies, drug allergies, or whatever, there's no contraindication. The only contraindication is when there is an allergy to something specific in the vaccine that we know that this patient has uh, allergies to polyethylene. Uh, what are, about the tests? Well, there have been tests with medications that have polyethylene glycol. However, on one has more than 3,000. It's the one that has been used as a laxative. And often the epicutaneous test can be negative and intradermal can give me a false positive reaction and we can avoid our patient from being a candidate to the vaccine. Currently, it's under study, this is new. Every day we have something new. Canadians uh, say, well, yes, we have to pay attention. You have to have surveillance. You have to dilute the medication. One in a thousand, one in a hundred, one on one. The vaccine, it has to be less than six hours. And to see the predictive value, and we can see this every day. I can show you different tests of polysorbate and, uh, you know, it's not good uh, to do the polysorbate uh, test. If what's good for me is the medications that are pedulated and 
that molecular weight. And you can see a really interesting study where there are the physicians of, of over 5,000 in a hospital in Italy when the first one already had reaction to the first dose and they were tested. And well, it turns out that they were negative and everybody took the vaccine. However, there were some others that had not had a reaction and it turns out that they had a history of having had a reaction with the vaccine. And there are very few for a definite conclusion. This one's not done because the test was positive and they had a high risk of anaphylaxis. So these are the medications or multiple medications and they were testing this and then they said, no, they have to be pedulated and at the right molecular weight. Otherwise it's uh, not good. So what can we say? Oh, okay, there's another test. This is completely new. Maybe tomorrow we have other trials, very few patients, these are six patients, where they mentioned that they performed uh, uh, some skin tests and they did so much better in this, uh, this uh, type of vaccines with nanoparticles and so on. And you can see here, they made the dilution, one in a thousand, one in 100 in the vaccine, less than six. And what did they say? There were a lot of false positives when the uh, vaccine was diluted. It could be that the patients were reacting. They mentioned that the activation tests could be helping. What do we know? That severe allergic reactions are good. And this indicate that the female is get the one that is predominant. And they are very common. And we have to take into account that any vaccine can give us anaphylaxis and that the rate of the um, pediatric vaccines is 1.31 that we do not know the recent changes. Fortunately, you have seen the platforms. You have seen how much, 2.2, 2.3, which is what we have with Pfizer. But every day, this is going to change. What do you think in Mexico, 0.1? And that's because it goes uh, according to the number of vaccines, the numbers of doses that were given and the ones that are going to give us more anaphylactic reactions. And what is possible like polyethylene glycol or the pedulated that have been adjudicated. This is something that has to be seen and, and it's more in women and the hormonal factor. And if the vaccines with multiple like anti-flu vaccines, they can give us a, a higher reaction if there's an association in this and the routine if we're being vaccinated with time, it could be that we uh, are, are sensitive. This is fascinating in the study of anaphylaxis in vaccines. Thank you for your attention. Muy bien. Gracias, Blanquita. La verdad es que... Very well. Thank you, Blanquita. As always, it's a pleasure to hear you. Lo que nos presentas. Eh, a continuación, le recuerdo que las preguntas a la doctora del Río tienen que ser... The questions to Dr. Del Río, I remind you that have to be through the platform, the Q&A, and we would be happy to go to the next presentation, that is anaphylaxis, uh, the medication-related anaphylaxis uh, by Dr. Gerardo Lopez Perez, that is well known by all of us. He is a GP from the School of Medicine at UNAM, specialist in pediatrics by the National Institute of Pediatrics, Infectology, Chief of the Service of Allergy of the National Institute of Pediatrics, Head of uh, Pediatrics, Integral Pediatrics, and he is the coordinator of the National Academy of Pediatrics. And he is the author of the book, First Contact Physician in the Pandemic of COVID-19 in 2021. 
Pues antes que nada, es un gusto estar con First ustedes. of all, it's a pleasure to be here once again in this important week for our specialty that is related to this topic that is so fascinating. Anaphylaxis to take on this topic in such a short time. Well, you know that this uh, has to do with so many elements. Uh, the image that we have as a logo, you know, we can have so many more the arrows that we could have, uh, uh, and this can be confused and so many things. This is so important. We know that we all have faith since we started being uh, uh, physicians. The answer of a uh, mom uh, that says, be careful, doctor, because my child is allergic to such and such medication or my aunt or the grandma had a reaction to the drug. So don't prescribe that. This concept has been generalized and often we are part of that condition where pretty much, yes, it is very variable, the presentation of each and one of these entities, but when they're talking about drugs, this is a condition that we must analyze a little bit more in detail. So we're gonna continue with this. Adverse reaction to drugs, to prescription drugs, to a medication that is uh, involuntary and is harmful, and that happens in doses that are usually um, utilized for prophylaxis, and the diagnosis or treatment of a treatment can be considered as an adverse reaction. Often, Often, this has been called as a simple classification type one or type two. Type one are the ones that are predictable and they're related with the direct effects of the medication. And I believe that we all have seen this personally, even when we say, oh, you know, such and such drug didn't set good on me or this medication was not good for me. So these conditions can be confused with a other type of re reaction. So that happens. Uh, type B are the ones that are unpredictable that uh, depend on the suscept individual susceptibility and uh, often are not related uh, because of the pharmacological effects of that element in such a way that having this breakdown in this concept, we can give that information to our colleagues that work in first contact as well as the population at large. So they understand that this is something that happens, the same element that it happens for their treatment. It's important to mention We have seen the multiple conditions. This is a chart with the synthesis of all the development with respect to the recent drugs in, and underscoring what we have seen from 1949 to 2018. We have studied the anaphylactic reactions to penicillin. So we have seen so many complications related to this concept. And obviously, since uh, um, 1902, they started with intolerance to aspirin. And we have seen so many elements. It's worth to mention that after 1967, where this is linked with the uh, discovery of IgE a year earlier, they start to finding out the hypersensitivity reactions that uh, were have been classified where everybody knows that we have hypersensitivity type one allergic and that is pretty much what uh, is part of the daily it's part of the daily exercise of our wonderful specialty the epidemiology with respect to these reactions, we can see that anaphylaxis that is drug induced. You can see any publication 
to have reports uh, with the many figures that are going to vary. So let's try to use the ones that are more common in such a way that they can give us an idea. Because probably if we ask regionally in Mexico or Latin America, what is the incidence that each and every one of us has had with the experience of anaphylaxis? And they can say, well, do you know, half of uh, the, the people that they see have anaphylaxis and I have not seen any severely sick or that in, uh, means in hospital management in the ICU. So we need to take into account references in order to consider this uh, as a epidemiological value. The ER visits, according to this paper, they are about one to 4,000 ratio with a mortality rate. This is interesting. Fortunately, it's not so high. However, it has been said that with respect to general anaphylaxis with other causes, they have seen in drugs an increase in the past few years of about 300%. And NSAIDs, according to some publications, represent some of the main causes. So they're talking about uh, um, about 50% on average that are IgE dependent hypersensitivity reactions, a uh, generalized hypersensitivity reactions, that is systemic reaction potentially can be life-threatening. As it has been mentioned, and Dr. Del Rio has been underscoring this, not all, all of them are deadly or life-threatening, but they have uh, a rating that they're gonna go in different levels of intensity. So this, sudden release of mediators that pre are presented because of the activation of the two most famous cells that are included in these conditions that are the, um, these cells and the basophils. This could be the prime cells in the basophils. It would be a clinical manifestation that we have seen. We need to underscore that many of these reactions are gonna have a biphasic behavior and this is something that uh, we forget. The drugs that are to have a considered in 10%, and this means that we need to pay a lot of attention about these conditions and not be too confident. And maybe somebody that we have uh, cared for with anaphylaxis of any level that you have classified could also repeat one in 10, the possibility of having these manifestations again. So I believe that this concept we should not forget about and we have to convey to our colleagues. So somehow they don't go through this situation. In adults, pretty much, the drugs can represent 10% of the causes of anaphylaxis in the outpatients. And the hospitalized, they go up to six times more. This condition can be associated and with the health condition, comorbidities, um, that it would be a subject that could be conditioning the development of more risk of anaphylaxis. These numbers that are being mentioned, we can say that NSAIDs represent within this that we have mentioned, 48 to 58% of the cases of anaphylaxis. Beta-lactamic, even though they are uh, mentioned in this condition, they only represent about 15% with other figures that may be very more or less in some small figures around this figure. Quinolones, about 9%. We have to be extremely careful when we decide to use an alternate in treatment that often we do this, 
thinking that what we're using is not going to harm our patients. So we need to be paying attention. Contrast media is something those that have more osmolarity that fortunately in some hospital centers they are not using anymore. They are responsible of about 30% in such a way that the replacement of uh, uh, low osmolarity, they have cut down this incidence of adverse reactions in anaphylaxis in the condition of these patients. This is a Latin American report of something that was published in 2019 when many of our colleagues participated where this incidence of anaphylaxis is presented with the causes that are mentioned here. At least in medications and diagnostic uh, media, the percentage is very important and it's 30 to 60 percent. And this goes uh, according to all of these foods are uh, very important there. And this is not directly linked with hypersensitivity. In children, as Blanca mentioned earlier, it's a challenge. Disability is relative. We all know that we uh, draw, uh, you know, we know that uh, uh, all of this can be stated and it's described that, that it's very difficult for the children to describe their symptoms, but we know that they're indirect symptoms that can help us or can uh, confuse us to say that this child is presenting some type of anaphylactic reaction. There's a very high percentage, relatively uh, high of the absence of uh, skin symptoms, about half do not have any skin reaction. And here we have other situations that is more rating than other things like problems to assess the blood pressure. And as pediatricians, we work on this and we know that blood pressure can be measured. And maybe for an internist, this is going to be complicated, the same as for us when we're trying to assess a patient with obesity, for example, that's huge. So this is relative. About 50% are not seen. And the incidence that we have seen in children is about 10.5 to 70 episodes on 100 uh, persons a year. So this is an incidence that really is not that high. I left for the end but it says a uh, lack of measurement of trip dates. If we are getting real strict, we can say that triphase in many of the conditions. And even more right now that what we're going through to be able to measure trip dates, it's almost, uh, uh, you know, something unreal. So lack of uh, measuring uh, trip days. Well, we, that's always have happened. And we're going to have that in the future as well. Anaphylaxis increases children with uh, comorbidities when we know that they suffer from allergies. So this is a condition that is taking us to have a perfect exploration, knowing whether a child can be considered as allergic, asthmatic. Let's remember there's a sub-diagnosis or underdiagnosis with respect to allergic uh, diseases. Uh, so it's difficult because the allergies are not diagnosed and then they are prone to react really severe in their exposure to certain elements like in anaphylaxis, so this is going to get so complicated. There's something that is really interesting to consider in the past few years. Obviously, 
they ha this has increased in teenagers up to 196% the report of the drugs. Maybe the best thing is because of uh, uh, the doctors being more sensitive to report this type of behaviors. So it is worth to see that this should be considered as something positive to say that uh, the food anaphylaxis uh, is there and the anaphylaxis to drugs increase in 212%. It doesn't mean that it's uh, you know damaging uh, their quality of life, but maybe it's because of more sensitization or being more uh, sensitive to this entity. So that's what I think that maybe after this week, we will have more diagnosis of anaphylaxis when we prepare before this type of situation. And this report in 2019, you can see other causes of anaphylaxis in children in this model of under 59 children. And we can see some ibuprofen, it's an analgesic agent that uh, it's used a lot in this age group. We have to be careful because it's not uh, just anything. We, we cannot be uh, afraid, but we need to consider that. Tanclomycine that, uh, um, no, isotromycine that it's used so much. And they can have an allergic reaction. The specific uh, response to a drug, most of them are going to have a haptane, and when it uh, binds to uh, a protein, it's going to create the behavior of an antigen that is going to trigger an important uh, reaction. The immune cells and inflammatory cells that are stimulated under this situation are going to have the induction of being able to create this chemical reaction to consider both basic elements, which is antigenicity on one side, that is something that with a drug this alters the structure of the protein, autologous protein, like for example, albumin, with the cells, with some receptors of the cells like integrins of selectins in a new protein that has been changed by these drugs. So at the beginning, maybe they are, they're not there, but this condition is what we call antigenicity. And this is what we know is the intervention of, uh, you know, the inborn immunicity for T cells. And that means that the dendritic cells are there and they're like presenting cells after having uh, recognized the patterns of that molecule. And that's going to give us an expression to a co-stimulating molecule to give us an immune, the adequate immune response for that type of situation. Anaphylaxis, we know what it means. It's important to mention that this concept uh, that they think that this is going to be deadly The way in which drug anaphylaxis can, you know, happen and the mechanisms, it's uh, uh, the one that is mediated uh, by IgE. We're going to hear about the ones that are not IgE mediated and that it turns into a fascinating situation because of the complexity of uh, the prime cell with respect to the huge amount of receptors that could present 
and that are going to reaction, they're going to have it, this important condition that the prime cell not only has the high affinity receptor for IgE, we need to take that off our minds. I don't want to show you the image because I'm sure that in the next presentation of Dr. Marilu, this, that she's going to be making a lot of uh, um, emphasis on this. This is really interesting and it's important, the uh, response, but that the conditions of the responses that are not Ig mediated are preponderant. So here, adverse reactions, drug adverse reactions, is a subclassification. So the pharmacological activity, obviously what we were saying, but type B that are pretty much that ones that are linked to an allergic immune response with certain intervention mechanisms like pharmacological interaction to the effect. And we see here this chart where type B Obviously, they represent allergies, the creation of a new antigen with the classical form of hyperreactivity to the drug. So it's clear that IgE mediated the intervention of T cells, the reaction to like carbamazepine, for skin manifestations like Steven Johnson syndrome, it's so important. IgG also in this immune concept, not all, not necessarily IgE mediated. Also, it has a basic important, particularly in hemolytic anemia or so. When we talk about this uh, drug receptors, this uh, drug is binded directly to these receptors. Here we have certain clinical conditions that are going to suggest that it's necessarily the intervention of IgE, the one that is participating in obviously pseudo allergic at the drugs that are binded to the receptors of uh, the uh, prime cells and some others in order to have something that could simulate an allergic response with a good manifestation for ticaria or angioedema. So you can see that is not so simple. So I'm not talking to the specialist in my comment, but yes, to our colleagues that not everything is IgE, but it's a condition that might be combined, antibiotics that can have a direct intervention with an anaphylactic response or with stimulation of the receptor to the immunostimulating um, protein, the prime cells or vasophils uh, at a certain moment or in beta-lactamic antibiotic that would work even in two areas, metamizol, quinolones, in elements that could be pseudo-allergic. It's interesting to mention this. With respect to IgE dependent, there are two basic mechanisms. One that is called the classical route, that is granulation gradual degranulation, where practically those activation molecules of vasophils are activated like CD203C are going to allow to form some vesicles that uh, are pockets. And when they're transported, they're going to quickly bind to the plasmatic membrane and they're going to generate a quick response. A second mechanism is through another vasophil receptor or other molecule like ventilation vasophils like CV63, where also this binding of these granules is going to release the content to transcellular space. So it's a slower, more gradual response in such a way that the prior one is CD2, 
103, and it could be more participative in the anaphylaxis phenomena in this one in more than a stable reaction. So we have that the triggers can be immunological, IgE mediated or non-mediated by IgE, where the effector cells are participating or not immunological, where some other cells are going to be part of this, like monocytes and macrophages. So we can see the difference in the mediators. Uh, and we know perfectly well that basophils, ma mast cells, but particularly are going to be part of this, are preformed mediators and carbocypepsidase and BASA. And the novel formation where the prime cell also participates can be important in the case of basophils and macrophages. We know that uh, they the, were going to have different organs with respect to the manifestations that we're going to be detecting in what has been described, skin, respiratory, GI, and cardiovascular. The release of histamine, and this is important to remember, is just something that is going to go by. Its peak goes five to 10 minutes, and then it disappears in 60 minutes. So while we are reacting, the histamine has caused all the damage in such a way that the metabolism degrades it and could buy histamine. And maybe we can wait and uh, identify it in urine in 24 hours with tryptase. Something similar happens, maybe with a little bit slower with respect to their elevation, reaching a peak in three hours. But because of this reason, it has been suggested that in the assessment, they have to take certain samples. If you have access to the determination of tryptase, the first one in the diagnosis that you established, the second one, two hours later, and the third one, 24 hours later. We can talk that at the determination of certain levels is important and 7.4 nanograms per ml, that would be the cohort uh, or cutoff value to say that more, that is not good and less is something not to be concerned. And to say that it has less and that value can be discarded automatically and that that patient did not have anaphylaxis. And on the contrary, it has been considered that the elevation 135% of the basal uh, value it's important to take into consideration the primary consideration, continuous of this assessment. It's important to take into account because the increase of 135% uh, uh, without getting to 11.5% of nanograms per ml, it's important to consider because maybe it has eight Maybe if it's increased 175%, and this would mean that this patient is presenting an anaphylactic reaction and it should be classified as such. At the end, what we have mentioned, a lot of the triggering elements, the phenotypes that we mentioned, the endotypes with respect to the intervention of the different cells and mediators, and I believe that everything gets to the same. And this is the end objective of this intervention. And I believe that we need to remember this. The end treatment, it doesn't matter. It's epinephrine. We need to be very specific. And epinephrine as a group that promotes this treatment it's like saying to a surgeon, you don't have an electrocautery or an element for hemostatics. And we need to have all the necessary equipment where we use it all. And in those people that have uh, uh, all of that, that they, uh, they must have it. So this is a condition that we should always have with us in order to decide that this is being done 
correctly and it had a lot of impact. So I was asking myself about COVID vaccines, how much with all those people have this, this anaphylactic uh, responses, how many are there, as Blanca was saying, if they're considering in all the application centers that the only thing that it should be applied is the pinephrine. And we have other independent mechanisms that are IgE independent, that are the ones that have been mentioned. And I want to mention that we can see how skin manifestations of many of us have seen in our patients, maybe at the level of the hospital, like uh, uh, generalized asymptomatic postulosis that it maybe happened earlier on my popular uh, situation or Steven Johnson or toxic epidermic uh, uh, necrosis. This happens, but in conclusion, all the subjects that have this clinical conditions they're condemned that in the future, if we expose them again, they're going to have manifestations that are going to be very severe of the same and maybe of their own anaphylaxis as such. So we have to be very careful. This is really interesting in the pathophysiology, and we should have all of this as an important factor. Another important item in this condition is that many patients get pharmacotherapy that is conditioned often by an inad inadequate dose in an inadequate time and that only conditions sensitization in such a way that not using right an antimicrobial therapy at a certain time or other type of pharmacological intervention that would allow us to have a sensitivity in a subject can have the conditioning of taking them to a re-exposure and to uh, show their anaphylaxis symptoms uh, at a later date. So not what we use at one time means that uh, is going to happen the same at the following time. There are important elements, genetic elements that could change the anaphylactic response and this is really interesting because not everybody has the same anaphylaxis. So we can see that the ethnic parties, genetic differences, environmental factors, socioeconomic levels, or the combination of different factors can make our populations to be completely different. And with this, we see what we were saying at the beginning of this intervention, where the figures or the incidence or prevalence of these entities, well, they, it depends on all of these elements. So I believe that we need to be aware about what are the elements that our population that we have, uh, uh, that we support can have to develop a certain uh, clinical condition. And this is the approach of the flow chart that we have proposed in the literature that is based in a clinical approach, based in clinical history. We can see and we really underscore at the level of triptase. And it would be great if we could aspire to this and to maintain anaphylaxis, uh, diagnosis, acute, or discarding the same. And we can see the sequence where I want to see important items. Obviously, the confirmation of diagnosis is clinical based under the condition as allergy experts of skin test or the right interpretation of a specific IgE or Rasofield uh, uh, test. But something very important that I want to underscore is the consideration of the challenge test. These challenge tests are important to consider an alternative to test. We have to be aware that for this type of intervention, that has to be done by this specialist and always with the support of a hospital. When somebody says, well, I, I, I have new challenges uh, 
and like the old uh, physicians that were looking at uh, the other things. So we have to be careful because this is not exempt of conditioning a reaction that obviously can create a condition that can damage some of the members of our specialties. If anyone dares to make a child, obviously they're going to be walking in critical the situations. And I think that the challenge tests, as we do it at hospital centers, everybody that is part of a, a specialty, we have to be very much aware for the personnel and our residents that should always be sustained in a media that has the minimum resources that are necessary to revert an adverse event. The first thing is not to damage and to consider how we can have an intervention with the patients that trust us. Not to damage means to have contact to all the requirements that our specialty states for the management of this type of conditions. Thank you for your attention. I'm so proud to have participated with you today and thank you. I want to thank the board Benjamin and Francisco for their kind invitation and I wish you the best. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. A pleasure to hear from you as always. And the questions are going to be through the Q&A. And we have Dr. Maria Luz Garcia Cruz. She's an allergy pediatrician. Doctor, subscribe to the ENT department at INEF in charge of the allergy service at the National Institute of Allergies, member of the School of uh, Pediatrics, Mexican Association. He has masters in upper management and health sciences. Dr. Garcia, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Federico. It's a pleasure and I wanna thank you for the invitation to this wonderful forum. And I have to talk about something that is very interesting is IgE mediated anaphylaxis, idiopathic anaphylaxis, and the one not mediated by IgE. It's important to be prepared and to save lives within idiopathic anaphylaxis Usually it happens by immunological mechanisms that activate the um, prime cells and have physical factors, ethanol, medications. And sometimes we're not able to know why uh, it's this the cause. And usually the things about anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis happens in 1% of our population, 35%. It's uh, medications, 32 foods, and 19% is uh, um, insect bites. Ana idiopathic anaphylaxis is 30% of the anaphylaxis. And sometimes we don't know why we have it. Four to 16% are children, 60% are women, and 40% have atopia. Clinical characteristics usually can be seen in generalized or variables. It could be malignant angioedema or other type of uh, uh, problems, type uh, uh, blood pressure, syncope, or a GI symptom. The variant does not have a response to steroids, malignant. Usually we need high doses of steroids usually 60 milligrams, at least 10 alternate. And the ones that has angioedema is going to be presented by urticarian edema. And systemic manifestations. 
La clasificación por frecuencia idiopática es más de seis veces The classification by it, that it's idiopathic is more than six times a year or once every two months. So less than six months, a, a, less than six times a, a year is less frequent. Cofactors are exercise, medications, infections, uh, med, uh, menstruations, and alcoholic beverages. We can have allergy, but usually the highest frequency in anaphylaxis is all it's egg, milk, soy proteins, additives, spices, additives, sulfites, and vegan diet. And maybe it's and not labeled properly. It could be cross-contamination throughout the manufacturing process or manipulation. And a study by Anibarro demonstrated that 22.4% of allergic reaction in foods were because of a hidden allergens like Blanca mentioned. There's a study that was done that after eating certain foods that the patients can have rhinitis and induced by pollen and epithelium anaphylaxis. And in this percentage of the patients, we have patients in which it was not done. And because it's anaphylaxis, they, the ISAC test was run and they saw that 32% it was because of uh, weed, 27 shrimp, 14 uh, peanuts, 9% uh, peach, 5% uh, to milk, latex, 5% uh, uh, hazelnut, 5% and 5% kiwi. And it was associated to so the anaphylaxis uh, syndrome in pancakes, uh, the um, flower worms, pollen, anaphylaxis induced by the pollen and uh, bees and fungi. We had we had a patient that when we run a skin test, it had uh, uh, to weed and to different things. Uh, and the second time that he had anaphylaxis, we asked that what he was doing, he said, well, I was cooking hamburgers in the terrace and he had a ligustrum, but it was a pollinization time. We sent the wife to take pictures and it was during pollinization and they were mixing the meat and they were cooking outside. So the anaphylaxis of this patient, it was because of hidden pollen in foods and it was very, very allergic. We have delayed anaphylaxis because the alpha gal because of the tick. Primary sensitization is related by IgE antibodies that is secondary to a tick bite. This anaphylaxis happens three to five hours later. Carter studied 70 patients with the idiopathic anaphylaxis that they didn't know what it was about. And six of them had uh, ana uh, you know, this type of anaphylaxis. So it's very frequent that we have this and that this is not present because of insect bites that usually are not seen. Sometimes they eat a live insect by accident and obviously at the distal esophagus, they're sensitive to the stimuli. And we can say it hurts, it hurts because it bit me. And this is superficial somatic pain because in the esophagus, uh, they don't have it. In some cases we have seen that is discovered because of the vomit of the patient because they had a eaten a wasp and it has to be considered in the stage of insects. There's uh, imitations of anaphylaxis, a severe cholinergic urticaria, asthma crisis, very severe psychiatric uh, problems, anorexia nervosa, it's possible. Metabolic changes in the cells induced by anorexia with the degranulation of mastocytes. Some patients, we can say we don't know what they have. 
This is a patient 14 years of age with three situations anaphylaxis. The first time he ate a hamburger and he had an anaphylaxis uh, reaction. Then he had pizza. He also had uh, ice cream and uh, it was methyl cellulose uh, that it was in all the different products. We did prick to prick with all these foods and then carbosymethyl cellulose uh, and it was positive in all of them. So we can see that this patient's tested positive and this resulted in more than five ml. This is another case where a 23 year old man had rash. It was shortness of breath after the infusion of Inger lactato, 5% of uh, sodium salicylate and we can see that Ringer Latato was positive and 10% maltose. The release of histamine with a concentration of maltose. And we saw that this patient was allergic to malt. This is another patient that we had. And it's a patient that was 21 years of age with five anaphylaxis events. He would go to INED by respiratory uh, disease related to aspirin. We did a challenge with aspirin. This is the baseline. And then lay, later, aspirin, 50 milligram, and it went down more than 50% in the challenge. And every time he would go to uh, the um, INED, he had an anaphylactic uh, shock. When he would go to INED, He would eat some quesadillas outside uh, in it. And after the quesadillas, he had an, an anaphylactic shock and went back to the hospital. At home, he didn't like to eat tortillas, but that, that was what he liked the most. And she would cook with soy oil. So after the fifth anaphylactic uh, event, we tested, we did the, the food test, the, all the food, and she was allergic to corn. So when we removed the corn, asthma improved, and he didn't have any anaphylactic shocks. Unfortunately, he has a male, 32, that I had anaphylactic after drinking beer. Sometimes we believe that some fluids cannot cause anaphylaxis, but this patient had anaphylaxis after the uh, drinking beer. Since he was 17, he started drinking beer and he had uh, um, you know, problems in the throat, angioedema, he changed to different brands, he cut down the amount. And the last reactions happen just by touching the bottle. And he, ha and he had a problem in, in his uh, throat, developed pressure in the throat after the intake of wheat with uh, seeds. This patient can tolerate the food uh, uh, with uh, the beer and uh, also when it's cooked by day so that he was having an allergy with a skin test against different types of beer and also skin tests against uh, wheat, corn, barley. And what we saw is UP3 was correlated uh, with uh, uh, corn, wheat, and uh, barley. He had anaphylaxis by LTP. The whole B14 in the beer was uh, heat resistant. 
the allergen and the beer is relevant and it can be uh, cross-related with LTPs of several allergens of uh, a vegetable origin. So we can speculate that this could be an alcoholic beverage with the absorption by being an alcoholic beverage, the absorption of the allergens increases to a quicker and most severe reaction. It's important because usually we don't imagine we have oral anaphylaxis by mites, the pancake syndrome. This is usually a study done in different countries. And we saw that the type of mites that can be responsible of anaphylaxis or the pancake syndrome and if they are developing severe symptoms, Anaphylaxis is uh, because of something in the um, fish. This uh, We need to know that anasakis and parvalbumin are known recently as allergens in fish. This is the last case. There's many allergens. This can be clear. This is a history from other patient. This is a patient that came for a revision with the pediatrician, was had a fever, and the pediatrician gave him paracetamol. And he says, before you go home, take the paracetamol. He was inside the hospital. He took paracetamol, and immediately he just uh, uh, got very sore, and he started with the pharyngeal stridor hypotension, he ran to the ER, then he got the adrenaline. And we can see 48 hours later when he was going to be discharged, there's an infection by a germ, diarrhea germ, and started with diarrhea in the patients and nothing but diarrhea, no fever. I went to see him and he was okay. And the nurse said, what can we give him? Electrolytes, we gave them electrolytes. And I was going directly to the parking lot when they said he had another anaphylactic shock. I came back uh, running, gave him uh, treatment. I said, what type of electrolytes did he get? He got uh, strawberry electrolytes and he just swelled up again. With this, uh, the skin test, he was allergic to the uh, colors not even to the electrolytes, but to red color. What we need to do is a physical examination to measure trip date and emergency situation. When we have the treatment to consider the hidden allergens, cofactors, insect bites, alpha-gal, the uh, uh, mast cells uh, disorder, different types of tests, the skin tests against the uh, uh, some allergies, specific IgE, if we don't do it, we have to run an ISAC. And we also must have 
de la anafilaxia y la referencial, ¿no? Dentro In de los anafilaxis. Because of the proliferation of mast cells as well as systemic manifestations. You are experts here. We have discussed what mast cells produce and to consider all of this, by mastocytosis, there are mainly clinical symptoms. The level of tryptase uh, have to be 11.4 nanograms per ml. And we apologize, but uh, the audio is uh, breaking out a lot in, in the original language. Classification can be primary, secondary, or idiopathic. And they demonstrate in degranulation depending on the dose and the specificity of the allergen according to the expressions of the markers and the activation of the surface in CD107. The response of macrophages does not depend of the concentration of the IgE levels. It can be regulated. Risk factors for anaphylaxis is more than 45%, over 15% for children. Trip days for anaphylaxis and in adults, physical stimuli, barrier sign and stress in mast cells. Mast cells These receptors can be degranulated by IgE And it can degranulate a receptor X2 coupled to G protein. This X2 uh, receptor coupled by protein G usually can be activated by some drugs. In IgE, what's in red, and with the X2 coupled uh, receptor coupled to G protein, and what we have in blue. Ecatiban, some other NSAIDs, or it could be activated. Many other reactions. Something very important is that they are going to have uh, different uh, substances like B substance, matostatin, and all of this, and aphylotoxins, we're going to be using these concepts. So where do we have these receptors that are anchored to G protein? lungs, skin. By NSAIDs, monocytes, and macrophages, and they're going to activate receptors and mediators. 
IgE mediated anaphylaxis and the cells are going to activate macrophages, basophils, and it's going to release histamine. Drug al uh, allergies, obviously, we're going to have NSAIDs, beta-lactamic, non-lactamic, anesthetics, and within NSAIDs, the ones that usually are produced the most or the ones that produce anaphylaxis more, aspirin, ketoprofen, metamisol, ibuprofen, diclofenac, paracetamol, naproxen, and everything such as tramadol. So really the ones that produce more than 59 are diclofenac and 18 to 59 are metamisol, ibuprofen, and minor zero to 17 is ibuprofen. What type of reaction do we have? Obviously it can be IgE mediated, non-allergic by the prime cells and the pathway of uh, the receptor of uh, G proteins. We can have the release of cytokines or the release of mast cells. We have subgroups of patients that affect multiple organs that are anti-inflammatory, that have allergy to NSAIDs and that have Sumter syndrome and only urticaria. But these patients that have anaphylaxis and that are broken in the first group that are affected in the skin, rhinitis and asthma. The second group has edema, and glottis, edema, rhinitis, and the edema. Fourth is skin, rhinitis, asthma, and glottis edema. They all had anaphylaxis and the patients with atopy have more reactions than those patients that only have asthma under control or rhinitis. This was similar in group one, but in group four, we can see that the more patients with the atopy are affected. And in group one, we have rhinitis, and this is pretty much the same. Something that is important is that at the, uh, the clinic where we see intolerance to aspirin, we have seen after diagnosis between the first reaction is usually aspirin, naproxen, metamisol. But after diagnosis, how many times patients have presented anaphylaxis? Obviously, Patients have two, three, four, or more reactions. And these reactions are given by a physician that is prescribed by an NSAID. And that uh, can happen with an NSAID. It's important to make sure that the patient knows and to have the tools so this doesn't happen again. We made a list of NSAIDs and we tried to include all the generic names for the patient not to have any problems. And the patient had three or more reactions. This is a case that is not so recent, 2016. polysorbate anaphylaxis. Forty-seven year old patient that is prescribed dexamethasone, thiamine, lidocaine, and obviously, obviously polysorbate. In the seventh application, he has urticaria and dysphagia. The second patient is 56 with the same medication and four hours later he has generalized a rash, erythema, urticaria, angioedema, coughing and pharyngeal uh, uh, rash. It's, uh, they perform 
a skin uh, test and another test for polysorbating is positive. As Dr. Del Rio has mentioned, a lot of the vaccines available for SARS-CoV-2 have polysorbate. With respect to polysorbate, there's a really interesting paper that mentions that patients that have allergies to certain vaccines or multiple medication, they can have this type of allergy to polysorbate because in the vaccines there's polysorbate and multiple medications that also have polysorbate. So there's a list of about 110 medications that have polysorbate. So nothing has been written. The skin test is not final, but we are on the way of studying it. The most important thing is to suspect, to be ready and to save lives. We have some cases that may not be as common and we sometimes miss it in some patients. What's important is to have a detailed clinical history to look for the involved allergen to know the culprit of anaphylaxis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Thank you for your presentation. I remind you that the questions have to be through the Q&A box. And now we're going to go to our last presentation for tonight. This is a presentation that has been recorded and is in English. So if you want to listen to the interpretation, you can click in the interpretation button if you want simultaneous interpretation. Our next presentation by Dr. Lori Ann Pamford van der Poel is a specialist in pediatrics at the hospital in London. She works in food allergies, chronic urticaria innovation in health. She has a member of the Pediatrics Council of the European Academy of Allergies and Clinical Immunology, EAACI, active member in EAACI in chronic urticaria in children. And she has presented uh, conferences about allergy and chronic urticaria in different educational situations, international and national meetings. Any questions from this presentation, please send them to this email, which are the questions of uh, the, it says preguntas, sma at compedia dot mx. So now we start the presentation. Hi, Laurie Ann van der Poel. Uh, a pediatra in Londres, Inglaterra. Good evening. I'm a pediatrician in London, England. In English, because my Spanish is not up to the job, but I'm still learning. Um, I am very grateful and privileged to be asked to speak at this talk. And the title, as you will see, um, I was asked to speak on mast cell activation syndrome. However, uh, I my usual work as an allergist um, is seeing children with general pediatric allergy, but I have a special interest in chronic urticaria, and I've built up specialist um, expertise in chronic urticaria over some years, and it really is um, a field of interest for me. In this clinic, I am seeing some children with mast cell um, disorders, and um, I gave a presentation some years ago um, at the BSACI, the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, which is why I was asked to speak here. I was asked to speak on mast cell activation syndrome. However, when I found out that the conference was about anaphylaxis, it made sense to talk about anaphylaxis in the context of mast cell disorders, and uh, it can fit quite nicely within. Briefly, conflict of interest. I have spoken uh, for Novartis at national meetings on several occasions. Um, I have no ongoing funding or research funding. So, uh, 
what do uh, how do mast cell disorders present to an allergist and how big of a problem is it and um, what are mast cell disorders what is mast cell activation syndrome how do I recognize and diagnose these patients and what is the optimal management and really why is it relevant to this um, talk today so in my clinic I see children who have uh, urticaria um, and angioedema, which, as you know, is the swelling and really forms part of the continuum of um, the, uh, the histamine response and other uh, mediators within the skin. It can be superficial. As you can see, we see the wheels. And when it's deeper, it's angioedema. These commonly occur together, but they can present independently and they can be quite a challenging conundrum at times when they present separately together um, and uh, it's useful to understand them as a continuum. So it may be helpful to start off with the case. Uh, we called it, is it allergy? And this was really uh, one of the children early on in my chronic urticaria clinic that presented a challenge. I was consulted on her because she'd had a chronic um, a history of chronic urticaria. She's a 14 year old girl. She presented to the emergency department with increasing lip swelling over half an hour. Um, when she was in the car on the way home from school. And she complained of throat tightening with flushing. Um, she was itchy, but there was no rash to be seen. No obvious trigger was identified. She's not known to be food allergic. she had had one vomit, was feeling faint. And um, she had on presentation, tachypnea, breathing fast, high heart rate, but a normal to high blood pressure. She was given adrenaline because of the sensation of throat tightening, along with these other um, multi-system symptoms. And um, she was also given IV antihistamine and hydrocortisone and observed in the high dependency unit overnight. Um, during that stay, she had another episode and adrenaline was given again. She had um, investigations done and you can imagine uh, what they were, the initial uh, observations beyond the first presentation, inflammatory markers, full blood count were all normal. She had a sinus tachycardia on ECG, but nothing else to see. And if you just give a thought to what else you would do uh, regarding this child and trying to understand what happened to her and her diagnosis. We found in her background history that she had had urticarial rashes and angioedema for about five months um, in the past. That had appeared to resolve. Uh, it was spontaneous, there was no association with food, no known allergies. The hives could last several days, no physical triggers were noted or exacerbating factors. Um, it didn't resolve with antihistamine, um, although the antihistamine did help the itch. There was a family um, history of autoimmune diseases um, of, uh, various different types, notably thyroid disease um, on the mother's side of the family and SLE on her father's side. One severe episode um, uh, on a previous occasion had been associated with uh, neurofen. You can see here on the side a picture of some of her hives and it may not be easy to see, but um, she also had episodic flushing and this here was not a raised lesion. It was um, the flushing which could come and go. As part of the assessment for chronic urticaria, there are a number of blood tests that we would do in addition to an acute presentation for what was thought to be anaphylaxis and did appear to be anaphylaxis. We naturally did a triptase um, complement. We are looking for anything where there's been swelling and she'd had a history of lip swelling. Um, to see if there is any chance of hereditary angioedema. In practice, I find that the children with that problem tend to have um, only angioedema and not the hives rash. However, we do uh, this for completeness sake. We look for inflammatory markers. We occasionally see children who have uh, had a history of celiac disease. It's not often picked up, higher rate in Italy, but it's worth doing. And we also look for any autoimmune um, associations. We see a high number of children with thyroid autoantibodies um, associated with chronic urticaria, which um, can, uh, is usually euthyroid. And it's of interest to see that there is some cross-reactivity 
between um, thyroid autoantibodies and um, the issue related to IgE receptor. I'm not going to talk about that in detail today. We, um, basophil histamine release is also useful. And um, where it's possible, we could uh, do basophil activation um, testing, which is now being increasingly done. Basic liver function tests, immunoglobulins. I always test for dermatographism, um, which is where if you stimulate the skin with a scratch, or we now use a standardized credit card type instrument. I wish I had a photo, which was developed in Berlin called the Frick um, test, which allows you to test four different prongs or different uh, pressure sensitivity of dem um, dermatographism. It's a rough guide, but it's very useful clinically. Uh, cold and pressure provocation tests um, can be useful. Urticaria and angioedema activity scores are really important to understand what kind of activity and impact and quality of life the patient is having. And then of course, the dermatology life quality index. Not all of these were done acutely. This was once the, the child had settled. There's more to this case, but in the interests of time, what I'm really trying to show is that um, we have children that present with anaphylaxis that have associated urticaria and a background history. It's important to do the assessment and there's beautiful guidance um, from ERKI, from uh, Torsten Zibbier, Marcus Mara's group in Berlin, that looks at how you take the urticarial history, um, all of the guidance related to the treatment of chronic urticaria. And you'll notice that at the moment I'm talking about chronic urticaria, but we'll come through to um, this particular child and what we did next. So she uh, did have dermatographism, her basophil histamine release assay was positive, and um, that can indicate autoimmunity related to the chronic urticaria, and it often means more protracted course. So in simple chronic urticaria, these children, if they have resistant urticaria, I'm sure you will know the treatment algorithm for chronic urticaria. They, if they're not responding to high-dose antihistamines, um, they tend to have a prolonged course, and they um, may benefit from omalizumab or anti-IgE therapy. However, they may also take longer to respond. And there are reasons for that. That's a separate talk, but it is fascinating. Um, she had slightly positive ANA and um, slightly low IgA. There was a little bit of a background history of um, upper respiratory tract infections in the past. And baseline serum tryptase was normal. I didn't see this child acutely. She did not have um, acute tryptase done, and that is a real pity because it is very useful to have the tryptase done during the acute event. Further history revealed that this child also had um, a long-standing history of, ga of gastrointestinal symptoms, particularly abdominal pain, but there had been some refl reflux, gastroesophageal reflux as part of the history, which had been treated in the past with Gaviscon by the GP, and she had also had a uh, referral to um, a tertiary gastroenterologist for review. No specific cause was found. Um, she had onset of heart palpitations as well between the A&E visit and coming to see me. And in fact, um, she uh, was a referral from uh, somewhere distant and she had had her cardiology appointment first because she could have had that, she had that done locally. And they found that she had uh, issues on um, sitting down, she had postural hypertension, she felt faint on occasion, and it was worse on standing, the postural element. She was found to be hypermobile as well as part of her general assessment, but had no history of joint swellings or any other joint symptoms. There was further family history in that her brother was being treated for eosinophilic esophagitis under pediatric gastroenterology and was also known to be hypermobile. So in this particular case, we um, were trying to work out if there was a link in this particular child and what else did we need to look for. When we look at a child who's had um, urticaria and uh, a presentation with um, anaphylaxis, um, clearly we need to find the underlying cause and mast cells come into it. But with these other systemic uh, problems, this was one of the first patients that I saw that had a constellation of multi-system involvement where I wasn't entirely clear if they were related or not. 
This is early on in my journey. And I've since um, done a lot of reading. There's a lot of work related to how these might be linked. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. For her basic management, she had improvement with high dose antihistamines. She had previously had control of her chronic urticaria when she'd had that episode for five months with just twice a day um, cetirizine. And we were able to achieve uh, that again, but acutely we needed to use four times the dose as per the ERKI guideline, which we'll be able to access easily. Um, uh, Montelukast um, was also um, added in for a period that has now been removed from the latest um, ERKI guidelines, but it may still have a role in the resistant patient where you may not have access to omelizumab straight away. Um, and if they don't have uh, adverse effects, right, it may be a useful tool. On two separate occasions, there were increases from the baseline tryptase, and that was intriguing because that then helped us um, towards um, looking at mast cell disorders. We ruled out, uh, it's important to rule out primary and secondary causes and idiopathic entities. This is the culprit, uh, the mast cell. And um, in this particular case, um, we considered mast cell activation syndrome and we'll tell you how we got there and how there's been more learning since. So what was the overarching diagnosis? Um, one needs to understand uh, what is histamine related and what is um, swelling that might have other input, um, namely bradykinin mediated um, swelling and angioedema. However, bradykinin mediated ones may have other clues and they tend not to be associated with the rash and all of these other features. It tends to be a differential of angioedema on its own. And so I'm not going to touch on it here, but what's intriguing is that we now know that um, mast cell disorders are complex and that basophils may be involved as well. I want to stick with MCAS anaphylaxis and the risks associated with that for the purposes of this talk and time's going quickly. So I'll move on. We looked at does, um, what can you do to alleviate the symptoms? And we looked at giving you antihistamines at top dose. This helped this particular patient. I've mentioned short-term Montelukast might be of benefit. And then how do we wean off epinephrine and steroid in these episodes if they are recurrent, if there's um, ongoing um, acute episodes, there have been times when it's severe that we might need to use um, steroids and certainly the patient needs to carry epinephrine. This is the case when you have mast cell disorders and really what we're talking about are twofold um, and I'll come to that in a moment, but that's where there are either too many mast cells in the body such as a primary mastocytosis, or when we're talking about uh, mast cell activation syndrome, we might be talking in fact about same number, but they're overactive. And I'll touch on briefly um, uh, on um, omelizumab, which can be of benefit, but um, needs there needs to be a, a holistic approach to patients um, that have had recurrent um, urticaria and episodes of um, anaphylaxis. This is the mast cell who um, basically has many, many functions and releases many mediators. And you can see them represented here. Uh, the mast cell has an undefined role in the immune system related to uh, bacterial defense and to um, parasites and uh, now that um, can be slightly corrupted and we can find that patients may have triggers for different reasons. There um, are autoimmune components being found in chronic urticaria and um, there are other issues that we will come across now. So really I want to focus on a practical aspect because this is not a common problem, but I want you to be able to recognize it. And for those who are interested in knowing more, there is more to the story and there'll be some references at the end. But we want to know what triggers those mast cells and when is it allergy and when is it not allergy? And you can see that the mast cell is responsible, depending on its location, for many uh, sort of manifestations clinically. And we know that there are many, many triggers. So so for um, allergy, we know that food allergens can trigger 
but there's increasing work looking at histamine itself and histamine histamine containing foods and whether or not there might be a role in certain individuals for a low histamine diet. The evidence is not well established, but it is actually growing. But I want our main focus to be on the factors that classically are associated with um, chronic urticaria and also therefore uh, mast cell disorders, the physical stimuli. So you always ask uh, not only what are the triggers, can you in make the hives come on? The, can you uh, make yourself get the hives um, because you know your triggers? They can be exacerbating factors and they are listed here. What is interesting is that for the patients that have idiopathic uh, mast cell problems, um, there does seem to be more of an impact of inhalants, commonly the deodorants, the young girls um, at gym complain about that as being one of their triggers. Infectious diseases, quite frequently we hear that um, either the initiating event may have been associated with um, some sort of infection, but also um, subsequently it can trigger an acute um, event. And these triggers in certain individuals can increase their risk of anaphylaxis. In particular, um, bee venom and bee stings are known in people with mastocytosis in particular to uh, be able to trigger anaphylaxis more easily and um, Therefore, uh, it's very important to establish uh, the risk factors for that and to have a management approach. We know about medications. We know that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are culprits when it comes to urticaria and there are other drugs. And in particular, patients that go to surgery, um, the different anesthetic drugs, different antibiotics that may trigger it. And you can see those listed there. And psychosocial factors are important as well. Uh, stress and anxiety play a massive role and it can be a chicken or the egg scenario. And I want to move on um, to uh, further slides because you'll see more, more on this. So the mast cell activation diseases or disorders are multiple. And in fact, the physical urticarias that we see or allergy that we see um, can be classed as a form of secondary mast cell activation disorder, chronic autoimmune urticaria is a secondary mast cell activation uh, disorder. But we also want to be able to uh, identify those that have an excess of mast cells. There are clues for that. We don't have the time to go through mastocytosis in detail, but what we're saying is that children and adults with mastocytosis are at increased risk of anaphylaxis and there's increasing um, data related to that. We can also see that um, there can be idiopathic mast cell diseases. We do see patients that have idiopathic anaphylaxis. One day we might find out what's triggering those, but for now there's um, a heterogeneous group of patients where we haven't identified a trigger. And uh, the same is true for angioedema, for urticaria, and for mast cell activation disorders. What which has been termed mast cell activation syndrome. And this is something that has been poorly understood, but Aiken et al. and Jackie in 2010 put forward um, some sort of preliminary um, plan for how one diagnoses these problems. And it's worthwhile having a look at that article. There's been subsequent work, and I really want to go through why it's important and about recognizing it rather than um, burdening you with um, detailed analysis of literature because it's an uncommon problem and I want you to at least think of it. You can't diagnose it if you don't think about it. So the burden of mast cell disorders, we can see it definitely impacts on quality of life. We're talking about mastocytosis. We're also talking about chronic urticaria and importantly, uh, mast cell activation syndrome. And we can see um, where the symptoms affect uh, multisystemically. And you will have been listening to talks about anaphylaxis and you can absolutely see within here that these symptoms cross over, that there um, is a distinct similarity to the symptoms of anaphylaxis. And it can be extremely tricky, A, to distinguish uh, between um, a sort of an acute episode of a mast cell disorder or anaphylaxis. And in fact, it pays to err on the side of caution. And um, I've, um, there is data um, from Escribano at, at all, and also from Hartman at all, I'll show you the references later, which show that there is a significant amount of anaphylaxis in these groups, in MCAS groups, about approximately 17%, and about 23% estimated for those of mastocytosis. 
So up to a quarter of patients with mastocytosis experience anaphylaxis. It's not a small amount. You need to identify those patients. And um, patients with this problem, including MCAS, experience um, uh, a massive uh, impact on their quality of life, and it's often underestimated. Sleep deprivation and the anxiety, depression, social isolation, and emotional upset. Again, we talk about I talked about the chicken and the egg because these problems feed into the disorder itself. We know that stress can trigger flares, but we also know that living with this problem that can be poorly understood also impacts on their quality of life. So how big a problem is CU and mast cell disorders? Um, there's um, a really lovely um, article which came out in 2019, which uh, looked at 18 studies included in a systematic review, which looked at the prevalence of chronic urticaria in children and adults across the globe. Um, it was a systemic review with meta-analysis. It's worth having a look at. There's not a lot of data that's specific to Mexico, but I understand from speaking to colleagues in Mexico that neither CU nor mast cells are a, a massive cohort um, of the patients that you see as allergists. Um, perhaps it would be different if there uh, are dermatologists as part of this um, conference, but um, it still is not common. And um, I've slightly obscured my data here, so I hope that you can see this slide. Um, but in, in Northern America, um, there's um, statistics showing that is 0.1% um, prevalence in that population. We can see it's low, but because it's uncommon, under-recognized, underestimated. Um, this is some of the data from there, and you can see that there are Latin American studies. I'd like to move on. You'll have access to these slides and the references. So I'm coming back to chronic urticaria because my patients that I've seen um, over the years who may have what we call mast cell activation syndrome or a mast cell disorder that has multi-systemic associations, um, they do frequently have a response to treatment for their chronic urticaria. If they're having chronic urticaria, they do respond to um, the treatment as outlined in the IAQ guidance and in most um, national guidance. Uh, currently, the, the British Society still has some areas in between where they mention Montelukast, Ranitidine, but in the uh, latest IAQ guidelines, we move straight from high dose antihistamines. Second generation, we want um, non drowsy, we want long lasting, so as not to impact on um, school work quality of life. We know that the drowsy antihistamines, although some people think it's desirable for sleep, should be um, avoided. And if that's one of my messages to you, that would be to avoid um, the first generation drowsy antihistamines. They affect quality of sleep. Um, as well as uh, act centrally uh, to affect concentration, and we always recommend the second generation. So you can increase up to four times the dose. There's a decent amount of evidence for cetirizine, loratadine, and flexofenadine on this. Um, however, there are other antihistamines available which are of benefit, and at the moment we need more data on the other antihistamines, uh, but we believe them to be safe, and um, I find that to be the case in my patients. But I always take care to review them uh, to make sure that we're not leaving patients languishing for a long time on treatment. And then we move to omalizumab. So when it comes to um, the, the mast cell disorders, primary mast cell disorders, this is not the indication for omalizumab. I'm talking about um, chronic urticaria. But in my patients that have mast cell activation syndrome or concerns about multisystemic involvement, I have found that um, they can respond to high-dose antihistamines, and I have had response to omalizumab as well, and it can be worth a try. Similarly, if it's not responsive, one can move to cyprosporin. However, there are potentially other options that one can look at. So if you want to look at a little bit more about mast cell disorders, about mast cell activation syndrome, there is, um, there's some references at the end, but what's important to know is that the transmembrane tyrosine kinase uh, receptor or CKIT receptor is really key in these disorders. And there is now um, more and more work looking at um, uh, triplicate defects, looking at um, genetic basis for mast cell disorders. And 
I, I do believe that the, it's a matter of time before we have a better understanding of muscle activation syndrome and that there are patients that I've seen um, who uh, need genetic review because I've seen uh, patterns across um, families and we're waiting for that data to come through. But for now, um, I'll move on so that we can focus on some of the practical aspects because really we're talking about anaphylaxis. All of these um, systems, uh, you know, all of the uh, manifestations that you see here, which overlap with anaphylaxis and can be challenging. However, you will have a history usually of um, this chronic underlying problem. And one of the clues I find useful is that um, it can also have flushing of the skin. And so I always ask to see photos of my patients because with COVID, especially, we've had telephone consultations, virtual consultations. I've seen some photos, but I um, ask to see the child and I want to see multiple photos across time because I do notice that the children that have mast cell activation syndrome or adolescents and I assume adults tend to have flushing and essentially an, a, an autonomic or dysautonomia um, associated with the issue, which is why there's an association with uh, POTS, which is uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And may, they end up seeing a number of different, different special, uh, specialists over time because there isn't a clear sort of, um, shall we say, MCAS march in terms of what one, what kind of symptom group one starts with and then it moves predictably across the groups. In fact, no, sometimes I see children that have been um, diagnosed with hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, type three, who then end up seeing cardiology, they get treated for POTS and actually the chronic urticaria can happen later and the other way around. So just to recap, if we're looking at the mast cell activation disorders, it's an umbrella term for mast cell activation. And um, we've, we need to decide, have we got primary um, mastocytosis, which can be uh, cutaneous or systemic, uh, where there's an overgrowth of mast cells and biopsy is helpful. I'll come through to the diagnostic procedures next. We've talked about the secondary group and then MCAS falls in that idiopathic group. So looking at that, there has been literature more recently, the references at the end, looking at the algorithm for diagnosing MCAS. And that's from 2019. And um, there's a large group um, associated with this work looking at somatic kit assays. And you can see that they're talking about recurrent symptoms consistent with mast cell activation with involvement of two organs. So that can be skin and gut, which is one of the typical system, uh, system combinations that I see in my clinic. But equally, it can be cardiology, uh, it can be rheumatology, um, so uh, uh, joint involvement, hypermobility. Um, elevation of one or more validated mast cell mediators in association with the symptoms. Tell you what those are in a second, but essentially tryptase is key. But what's important is that the tryptase is not always up. So a normal tryptase at the time that they're being seen is not always um, excluding the diagnosis. And it's useful to have tryptase in the acute episode. And that is not always as easy as it sounds, as you know. Um, we also um, do uh, urine mediators, and I'll come back to that. But you can see that now that where it's feasible, there is um, a kit mutation um, assay, which can be done genetically. One can do peripheral blood or bone marrow, and also buccal swab um, tryptase is increasingly be being looked at, but these um, are not in the typical um, clinician's armory, and they're not in mine, even though I run a specialist chronic urticaria clinic. And looking forward to looking at that in time, and we've been part of Genome 100 studies as well. So the diagnosis, the clinical picture, mast cell activation on two or more systems. We've talked about the serum tryptase. How high does it need to be? Typically, it's about 20% above the baseline. We look at urine histamine and urine histamine metabolites. And um, we now are able to ask for that at our hospital. It's a 24-hour urine collection. And it's tricky. And it's not always positive. And so we have to treat systematically. And what I do my best to do is um, exclude where possible as well, because we have patients reading um, a lot on the internet. They absolutely diagnose themselves. And um, there are times where 
we can actually say, look, these are your symptoms. You've got urticaria. We've excluded these important things. Your urticaria is manageable with um, antihistamines. Um, your hypermobility, there might be certain um, sports that you would avoid, but on the whole, um, you can be managed with these things. And you have a degree of mast cell dysfunction. And just being listened to and having someone take them seriously and come up with a management plan and liaising with the other specialists involved um, often is a very helpful approach to develop trust and to get people through their symptoms because they're facing a lot of resistance from people who don't understand it. And I'm trying to keep as open a mind as possible because I've now seen enough patients where I think that there's more to be learned and I want to maintain an open mind. But equally, we've seen in our allergy patients um, and in our urticaria patients that there can be a psychological overlay which exacerbates things makes the clinical picture difficult. Um, but what's important is we need to keep our patients safe and treated. There are some um, suggestions here for treatment for those who are looking a little bit further. We've used mast cell stabilizers in some of our patients with, um, uh, with some benefit at times. There's not a large evidence base for it, but it is mentioned in weighty tomes these days. So it is worth a try and it can be useful to have something else to try if there's um, a dearth of, you know, of, of really effective evidence-based treatments. Aspirin, I've not used, and in fact, I avoid non in these patients, um, but it is listed in Cardi et al's uh, management of MCAS, and Omelismab may be helpful as well. So to end off, I would like to just briefly talk about the, the management. It starts off with diagnosis. I reiterate that if you don't Think of a mast cell disorder, you're not going to make the diagnosis. So it can the MCAS um, entity itself may be elusive. There's more we need to find out. But um, as I've explained, many of our patients do find, sorry about the typos there, but we do find that mast cell dysfunction is accepted. But I know from speaking to other specialists who have uh, much more experience than I do um, in adult care and dermatology who have to be really careful with their words because you might write mast cell dysfunction, um, but it then can be corrupted in subsequent letters from other people and said, you know, so-and-so has diagnosed mast cell activation syndrome, and that can be uh, tricky at times. Um, the tests, we have serum mast cell tryptase at our disposal. Ideally, you want it drawn at the time of the episode, 30 minutes to two hours post the start of the episode. And then once everything's settled, at least a few days later, preferably more tends to be in the outpatient visit when everything's settled, you do the baseline. The urine I've mentioned, the test that we do in our department at the moment is N-methylhistamine, 24-hour urine, urine collection. It is a little bit of a pain to do. The labs don't love it either. Um, and I reserve it for very few patients that have multi-system involvement where I think it may be helpful if it's positive. And also I want to record these so that if we do find positive cases that we will then um, you know, build an, an evidence base that will prove or disprove um, these issues. And um, the pragmatic part of the management is to know that anaphylaxis absolutely is a problem and that um, carrying adrenaline auto injectors just as you would for any other um, problem that is at risk of anaphylaxis is appropriate. In particular, primary mastocytosis, um, because we know that, as we said, you might also have food allergy, you might also have uh, a bee sting, but because of the massive amount of mast cells um, available to your body, the cytokine uh, release that results can be life-threatening. So they need written medical information. And we do have a, a kind of a, an action plan. I give an action plan for my chronic urticaria patients as well, because we're giving them doses of antihistamine higher than normal. We explain that they um, may or may not be at risk of anaphylaxis, depending on what the story is. So chronic urticaria tend not, tends not to be um, at increased risk of anaphylaxis. Um, on its own. However, mastocytosis, MCAS may well be, as I've mentioned. And then we need to also acknowledge what we've talked about, that patients who are struggling with uh, the diagnosis, with troublesome symptoms, um, with resistance not being believed, um, it, 
it um, really does need psychosocial support. So we're very lucky in our unit where we look after chronic urticaria that we have a psychology team as part of the assessment. We do a pre-assessment and we do a post-therapy assessment, including for our omelizumab patients. And psychosocial uh, support can be very useful for these patients. We're a tertiary referral centre. We don't offer a full uh, package, but in individual cases, this has been extremely helpful to be able to wean patients off multiple visits, um, lots of concerns, and to be able to contain um, their management and say, look, this we accept that you have these problems. Here is some treatment which is of benefit. We will keep following you up and we will see what else needs doing and we will refer you appropriately if um, that's required. So the ideal um, scenario would be to have clearly agreed diagnostic criteria, to have accurate, ready available, uh, affordable tests, genetic markers that are easy, affordable and available, um, just as we do for many other things. And um, ideally, we'd like to be able to cure this, switch it off, understand what triggers it, prevent it. Um, and appropriate multi-specialty, uh, multidisciplinary approach, joint working to rationalize and optimize that patient's care, give them something which works, allow them to feel listened to and to reduce the number of uh, times they have to explain themselves to new specialists um, that will really improve the patient experience. And for psychosocial support to be an accepted part of the package of treatment so that it doesn't feel to the patient that we're saying, oh, you're crazy, you'd better go see the psychologist. We are quite good in our department, and I'm sure you are too, uh, where you have um, patients that are anxious from having experienced anaphylaxis, it's completely understandable. Some suffer from post-traumatic um, stress, that uh, psychosocial support should absolutely be part of the package. So I'll finish off the take home messages um, are here. We've already discussed them. It's written down in point form for your reference. And then I hope that we've answered some of the questions that I posed at the beginning and that you take away um, some interesting points, but I've put in bold there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And I'm wondering if perhaps the prevalence across the world that's so extremely low is partly because it's unrecognized because we don't have good diagnostic tests. And chronic urticaria um, started like that decades ago when people didn't want to see patients with this, you know, these crazy people with this skin stuff that came and went and we didn't know what the triggers were and now we're finding that it's an autoimmune basis we've got treatments that work and perhaps this is going to be the same for mast cell activation syndrome certainly mastocytosis um, there's a clear pathway for diagnosis and treatment but there are opportunities here for research and serving your patients better there's some uh, resources that you can have a look at and um, I hope you've enjoyed that thank you We thank the participation of Dr. Van der Poel, and we remind you that the questions that you may have, to send them through questions, preguntas sma at compedia.mx. And thank you for being here tonight. Dr. Benjamin Cepeda, thank you. Thank you, Federico. Thank you for your wonderful participation. And I want to congratulate Marilu, Gerardo, Blanquita. Excellent presentations. Dr. Loren, as well. Thank you for staying here. This has been an intense week with 470 uh, participants. Uh, Thank you. I know that it's long. We have two more dates. Let's enjoy them. This has been excellent topics, all of them. So thank you for being here with us and we'll see you tomorrow. Two more days. Thank you again, Federico. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Stop.